I'm so happy to announce that I finally determined my personality. I love pop music, and I hate the letter K. Time to celebrate by turning my head to the right- Are you kidding me right now? What is K-pop? Aside from Casey Neistat's favorite genre. That's what I intend to find out as I run through some of the genre's most acclaimed albums. Will I be converted into a K-pop fanatic? Will I stan Luna? Will this channel be solely dedicated from here on out to making fan cams? We'll have to find out. So this isn't an expert opinion or a definitive guide. This is just one guy trying to get more into K-pop and sharing his thoughts in the process. To get started, I asked Twitter what albums they would recommend to a K-pop first-timer. The first record I checked out was FX's Pink Tape. It's the group's second album, released in 2013. Immediately, I was struck by the cover design and how it mimics an old VHS. Aw oh, man, this record's got two of my favorite genres, romance and cult. It's an untapped market, that's all I'm saying. The VHS design extends to the physical packaging as well, which even got it a Red Dot Award in 2014. And that level of detail feeds into the album's concept, mixing teen love archetypes with art film sensibilities. I'm struck by two things listening to this record, two things that will guide my impression of this genre as I continue on. The first is that K-pop sounds like pop music. If only there was something in the name that could have clued me in. The second thing has to do with the K in K-pop. That letter stands for a language I don't understand, but that's not a big deal for me. There's a reason most people use the shorter name. In the ongoing war between music and lyrics, I've been team music all the way. And while I may not understand everything on a first listen, the tone of the music is usually enough to give me a rough idea of what the song is about. Listen to the song Airplane, for example. Glistening keys, soaring synth pads, the repetition of the words This is, of course, a song about creating a budget spreadsheet for the upcoming fiscal year. Or a lead single, Rum Pum Pum Pum, which exudes confidence as the group asserts their romantic dominance. It also demonstrates how Justin Bieber's Little Drummer Boy has influenced pop music to this day. While I did not understand the intricacies of their words, I was still able to enjoy myself. That said, there are plenty of resources to get translations and romanizations of the lyrics. The one I saw most frequently recommended, and the one I look to most often, is ColorCodedLyrics.com. It provides lyrics for many songs, plus it color codes them, so you know who is saying what. If only there was something in the name that could have clued me in! Now that I understood what K-pop meant, I then had to reckon with the fact that the name is incorrect. The term K-pop is a bit of a Western misnomer. Not all Korean music is K-pop, which, as I say it aloud, makes a lot of sense. Us Americans don't call all American music, or even just American pop, a-pop, right? What we Westerners call K-pop is more accurately referred to as idol music, because the performers are called idols. That's one bit of terminology that I learned, and I'll share more terms as we keep going. Anyway, yes, Pink Tape was a good introduction. I recommend these tracks if you want to listen for yourself. Those songs and all the other ones I mentioned going forward will be in a playlist linked in the description. Next up on the docket is Luna, one of the most recent groups to gain popularity. They spent 18 months rolling out this group with each of the 12 members getting a spotlight and releasing their own music. This all culminated in their debut album, Plus Plus. But the record I'm looking at is 2019's XX, which is a repackage of Plus Plus. From what I've seen, repackages happen often. It's sort of like a deluxe version where it might add a few new tracks, but in some cases, it'll double the track list and even introduce a new album concept. More like large-scale DLC for a video game. Anyway, XX isn't too far removed from what I heard on Pink Tape. The main difference being, if Pink Tape pulled more from contemporary EDM of the early 2010s, XX pulls more from the modern processed R&B of the late 2010s. It's almost as if they were released in those respective periods. Lead single Butterfly, Curiosity, Perfect Love, I don't think they would be out of place being sung by Ariana Grande. I'm also picking up on a small hint of 90s pop influence. Or maybe that's because Satellite reminds me of my boo. Check out those songs I just mentioned, but we're not out of this lunacy just yet. The next album is Luna Odd Eye Circles Max and Match, or as title calls it, Max and Match 8809681186520. Now I was curious, why is Luna's name attached to this project? Well, it's because Odd Eye Circle is a subunit of Luna, 
comprised of three of its members. This is apparently a common practice in idol music. Subunits will break off and release music catered to their role in the group. Also, remember how I said Luna's rollout lasted for 18 months? As they announced each member, they would also announce the subunits and their respective music. That's why Max and Match predates XX by a few years. The resulting album from this subunit is a lean and tight package. The highlight for me is easily Girlfront, and there's a chance you're already familiar with this one in passing. Look, I'm a simple snare, okay? You give me these high-pitched, short-attack, sawtooth synths, and I'm happy. It's such a good song that they do a slightly different version to close the album out, and it still works. Listen to those two for sure, plus Sweet Crazy Love and Lunatic. All right, let's do a change of pace. I use Palette. Not only is this the most intimate record I've heard so far, but it's also the first record I've checked out that's only by one idol. In line with the scaled back roster, Palette has a scaled back sound. Down tempo singer songwriter stuff, like a Korean Corinne Bailey Ray. Though I might just be thinking that because she gets name dropped on the title track. And IU even got to sing with Corinne a few years back. Nice. The title track is for sure a highlight. Same with the beautiful string-led ending piece and the laid-back R&B of Can't Love You Anymore. And again, I gotta highlight the physical packaging. Honestly, if you wanted to get me into the genre, you just had to tell me that CDs still reign supreme. But I know what you're asking. Michael Snare, where is the idol equivalent of Evanescence? Easy! This is Dreamcatcher with Dystopia, the Tree of Language. I saw people describe this one as a mix of K-pop and metal. Now when I heard that, I was like, oh, is this Korea's version of baby metal? Turns out, not really. I wouldn't call this record metal per se, but definitely symphonic. It's easily the most epic sounding record I've heard yet. When you hit me with those syncopated strings on the chorus of Scream, <laughs> Or that synth on the chorus of In the Frozen. Or the headbanging chorus on Sahara. Oh, those are definitely the killing parts. Oh, sorry, that's another K-pop term. The phrase killing part refers to the best part of a song, which is definitely different from how Americans mean it. All right, everybody, get ready. Harry Styles is about to do the killing part. All of those tracks I mentioned are worth a listen. And you know, I just noticed now, I've only been looking at girl groups or girl idols so far. Can we get some boys in here? Here we go, this is Shiny and their fifth album, One of One. I briefly tasted hints of 90s pop earlier, but One of One is not subtle in its influences. The production on this definitely harkens back to the 90s, specifically that decade's R&B and New Jack Swing. I'm imagining Bruno Mars' 24 karat magic, but K-pop. The title track is a stellar example, declarations of love over this classic hip hop beat. Hit me with that gated snare and I will do unspeakable things. Check these songs out, plus tell me what to do from this album Album's repackage one and one. And speaking of repackages, let's move on to the repackage of Red Velvet's second album, The Perfect Red Velvet. So apparently the name is a clue as to what the music will be. The group classifies their songs to reflect their red side, vivid, poppy, and the velvet side, toned down, classy. Their very first single, Happiness, for example, would fall on the red side. Sorry, but one minor tangent, uh, the original MV for Happiness included overt references to Hiroshima and 9-11. That's not a joke that's not me reading into it too much like look look at this they're just they're just there for some reason like perfect red velvet is an example of the velvet side in comparison to shiny's one of one this record is full on r&b pulling less from new jack swing and more from modern edm and trap especially on lead single peekaboo opener bad boy and perfect 10. <laughs> Let's do one more retro-leaning R&B record. Exodus is the second full-length album by boy band EXO. This one is a darker spin on Shiny's New Jack Swing style. One of Shiny's members is even on here to contribute lyrics. This album also has contributions from Teddy Riley, aka the guy who's credited with starting New Jack Swing. Definitely check out Call Me Baby, plus these other songs. You ever heard of BTS? I knew I would be talking about BTS at some point. They've become one of the biggest bands in the world, full stop. The record of theirs I saw the most recommendations for was Love Yourself 
Tear. This is the second in a series of three albums and one music video, all under the umbrella of Love Yourself. The first album is about falling in love, the second is about the breakup, and the third is about moving on and learning to love yourself. In full honesty, I already listened to this album when it first came out, and I remember... liking it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Fake Love especially, that's still such a good track. But I think I've come to like it a bit more, not only because I know the concept behind it, but also because I've heard other records in their catalog, and I can appreciate Tear's place in said catalog. I mean, check out V with this choreography. Pretty clever stuff. Check out these songs. While you're at it, check out Home from their album Map of the Soul Persona. That song's a jam. But BTS hasn't been the only group to achieve worldwide recognition. There's also Blackpink, and their debut album... The album. Blackpink is big and loud and brash, and I like it, for the most part. Tons of horns and themic choruses, and basically no subtlety to be found. Admittedly, some tracks on this got annoying pretty quick, but also these tracks probably slap more at parties or in a live setting. My favorite was the lead single, Ice Cream, featuring Selena Gomez. The consistent use of metaphors comparing ice cream and jewelry is nice, and the part where they say, Snow cone chili, get it free like puts a big old dumb grin on my face. Like, it's just, it's so fun to say. Check out these songs. Coming up next is Twice's Formula of Love, O plus T equals less than three. Technological romance. This is the first record I've checked out so far to overtly pull from disco. If I may make another comparison to an English language pop album, take Future Nostalgia, make it Korean, and you've got a formula of love. For that reason, I enjoyed this one too. Moonlight, Scientist, Fall in Love Again, all of them got me out on the dance floor that I definitely have in my apartment. I also want to take this time to point out not only how extravagantly produced these MVs are, but also how they still stay in line with the song and album concept. That might sound like a low bar to clear, but like, this is what English-speaking pop music videos look like. This is what we think is cool, I guess. Next up is Yukika's Soul Lady, which is a blend of K-pop and... <gasps> City Pop? Oh, this is absolutely gonna be my jam. I've never gotten to speak about this until now, but in recent years, I've become a sucker for City Pop. There's something about it that packs a certain emotion mixed with optimism, melancholy, envisioning this bright future, even with the baggage of the past, still with you. Yukika's record hits all those notes for me. The chill vibes of I Feel Love, Cherry's Jubils, and Shade are all lovely, but the real Nighthawk Steak and Taters is in that title track. Oh, <laughs> This next record makes for a nice compliment to Yukika, Wonder Girls Reboot. The concept for this album involves the group creating a fictional band within the group, except the fictional one plays all the instruments along with singing. It's certainly made for a unique comeback. Oh, I should also clarify, comeback in idol music doesn't really mean the same thing as it does in the US. Comeback is the term used for any time an idol or idol group releases new music. But don't call this a comeback, even though that's exactly what it is, because they've been here for years. Wonder Girls are considered an important act in late 2000s idol music, and Reboot reflects the confidence that you get when you do something for a long time. It veers into 80s synthwave more than any other record I've checked out. Lead single I Feel You exemplifies that perfectly, and it might be one one of my favorite idol songs I've checked out so far. Now, the album's title implies that this is the beginning of a new era for the group, but in reality, it was more like that one show on Hulu because this would end up being their last record. Still, they went out on a high note. Give these songs a listen. Next is Psy. That's right. Psy. That's Psy. Turns out, he's got about a decade of releases under his belt prior to Gangnam Style, and that all started with his 2001 debut album, Psy from the Psycho World. It's, get this, a 90s era rap album. The man who would later scream at someone's butt then throw up in a bathroom with Snoop Dogg was out here rapping like some debonair playboy. Apparently, this album stirred the pot quite a bit back in the day for how candidly Psy spoke about these subjects. Take a song like I Love Sex. Now, it took me a few days of research and asking top respected individuals in this field, but I can safely say 
that this song is about how Psy loves sex. I've stated before that Psy was immensely important for pop music in the 2010s. If it wasn't for him, we may not have witnessed other groups seeing this insane level of global success. So it's nice to see how he got his start. Check out these songs. For my last record, let's look at another pioneer in idol music, Girls' Generation and their 2010 album, Oh! From what I've read, Girls' Generation came around at a time when the Korean idol industry was taking baby steps into becoming the powerhouse it would eventually become. Their debut single even went on to become the soundtrack to a university protest movement. This record definitely takes me back to turn of the decade synth pop, especially its title track. <laughs> and the group's big breakout hit, G. Sweet Talking Baby weaves in the melody from Boccherini's string quintet in E. I'm usually not huge on classical interpolations in my pop music, but, but I, I like this. And Forever vaguely reminds me of the legendary theme from Gitaru Man. This is really one of the highest compliments I can give to something. A good record overall, and a nice way to close out my first dive into idol music. So, with all of those records off my list, am I now a fan of idol music? Yeah, sure, why not? Surprise! I, a fan of plenty of pop music, like a genre of pop music. Who would have thought? It certainly helps that Korean idol music often pulls from time periods of pop that I like, such as 80s synth pop and 90s R&B. At least based on the records I sampled, most groups I checked out are in the third generation of K-pop, with a few in the second and fourth. Now, I do also recognize that my enjoyment is still fairly surface level. In fact, when I asked for album recommendations on Twitter, a few people told me that albums Albums aren't really the main focus in this genre. Oftentimes it's just the singles, or the MVs, or the live performances, or even the packaging. The visual aspect of idol music seems to matter as much as the musical. That said, I don't think that diminishes albums as an entry point into idol music. Exposing myself to the albums also meant exposing myself to the MVs and overall visual aesthetics, so different means to the same end, I guess. Hell, even just editing this video meant I had to engage with the visuals as far as you know. They'll never learn my secret editing strategies. I don't think there's a wrong way to get into any genre of music, as long as you don't delude yourself into thinking that your way is the only way. And whether you go for the albums or the MVs or the singles first, I hope that sharing my journey has given you a better idea of the genre and where to start if you're interested. But now I'll pass the question on to you. What do you think of these albums? Is there an album or song or live performance or MV that you would recommend to someone trying to get into this genre? Let me know in the comments. I enjoyed my time with these albums, and I didn't even have to make a fan cam to do it. Though that didn't stop me from learning how. Oh, 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 oh.